surveys had been done. Um, 560 surveyors with another 1,500 or so um, volunteers helping those surveyors. Um, 18 million individual birds counted over those 21 years um, and 171 um, different species included in this survey. So pretty, pretty amazing effort. Um, the survey was, st was started in 1999 as a collaboration between, um, as we were then known, Bird Studies Canada um, and Environment Canada. And it was led by Birds Canada with some help and support by um, Simon Fraser University staff um, and Environment Canada biologists. And um, throughout the years, we've been funded um, by a number of different um, sources. Um, Environment Climate Change Canada has been a huge supporter through, throughout the project. And we've been able to put out a series of different um, technical reports and publish papers throughout the history of the Coastal Waterbird Survey. Um, and this 20 year trend report that we just put out is a really nice um, piece to, to show the effort that's gone into this so far and um, update some of the results that we published in 2012 about the survey. Um, this is a recent infographic we created um, and I'll let you soak this in a little bit now, but um, I also encourage you to, to go find it on um, Birds Canada social media and on our um, website blog. A really nice infographic to, to share with the public um, and help get people interested and in understanding what's happen, happening with birds in the Salish Sea in a little bit more digestible format than listening to me talk for 40 minutes or um, reading the, the in-depth scientific paper. Um, so a nice, a nice visual way to share that a lot of our coastal water birds are unfortunately declining, um, but there's also some good news stories that we have a, a number of species that are showing stable trends over 20 years. Um, and then talking about some of the reasons why this is happening, things like urban development, that I'll get into more later. So the Coastal Water Birds Survey um, is a monthly citizen science project. Um, each month on the second Sunday between September and April, um, volunteers go out to their dedicated section of coast and count all of the water birds that they see in that area. Um, we try to synchronize this so that in theory, all, all of the surveys could be added up together to look at population estimates. And it also helps make the data more comparable. Um, to help with this, surveyors are also trying to survey within two hours of the high tide um, all across BC's coast. Um, and then collecting a bunch of general survey um, weather um, disturbance effort data, as well as counting species in different um, regions. So inland, so above the high tide line, birds in the near shore and birds in the offshore. Um, this isn't something we used in this analysis, but it's really useful in kind of more detailed analyses of certain um, areas or certain species. Um, birds that are flying through the area are not counted. So this is an assessment of birds using our coastal habitat. So an eagle hunting is counted, um, but a gull flying past would not be counted. Um, so these are really birds that are using the coastal habitat that the surveyors are looking at. And for the most part, this is a, a water bird survey. Um, so all the birds you'd picture um, people out counting, all the gulls, all the waterfowl, seabirds, shorebirds, um, herons are counted as well. Um, but, but volunteers are also counting uh, raptors that are using the area and corvids and kingfishers. Um, part of this is because um, corvids and uh, kingfishers using the coastal habitat for feeding quite regularly, and raptors are not only feeding um, on fish and other birds on the coast, but also feeding on water birds. And so it's it's a useful um, group to collect data on to look at how that might affect distribution of water birds. Um, raptors and corvids, I'm not going to talk about further, and we didn't include them in this uh, water bird analysis. Um, so in 2012, when an original paper using this data set was published, we had about 10 years of data, and there was only enough data in the Salish Sea to look at trends for species. And so at that time, we just focused on the areas in this left map. And this is where we have survey areas or survey sites within the Salish Sea. Um, with 20 years of data now, we actually had enough data to look at some trends on the outer coast. And so this includes um, areas on the outer coast of Vancouver Island, and then also the central and north coasts of BC. So for the first time, we were able to um, not only look at trends in these two regions, but compare how trends differed 
there are a lot of species in between these two regions, um, which um, made for a very interesting story. And when, when we did the analysis, the other thing we did is break species down into um, a few different groups um, based on their migration strategy and based on their foraging strategy to look at whether certain species are doing worse than others um, based on these strategies. Um, so for migration, we broke birds into whether they were local breeders. So these are year round coastal residents, things like glaucous wing gulls that we see all year round and also breed here. Um, short distance migrants, so things like redneck grebe that spend the winters on our coast, um, but move to the, just the interior of British Columbia to breed, um, so they aren't traveling all that far. And then long distance migrants, so a lot of our shorebirds, um, some of the sea ducks that go up and breed in the Arctic and boreal forests, um, and so these are considered our long distance migrants. And then we also broke um, species down into four different feeding groups. Um, so and these are feeding groups based on what they tend to eat in the Salish Sea primarily. Um, so piscivores, uh, those fish eating species, um, benthivores like scoters that are um, diving down and feeding on uh, benthic organisms like mussels and clams. Um, herbivores, mostly are dabbling ducks and omnivores, a lot of our gulls that are eating a very varied diet. Um, I won't go into the stats in detail, um, we have an amazing uh, bird population scientist at Birds Canada that um, spearheaded a lot of the analysis of this, this work um, and can talk about stats way better than I can. Um, but to give you a general sense of what the trends we're looking at mean um, for each um, species here. So this is just an example of a fluffy duck um, seen on route one, two, three, four um, in a year. We focus on a series of months that make up kind of the core wintering period for that species. So to say December to March. And then we look at the mean count at that site for that species um, in that year. And then that is used um, for all the different species at all the different sites. And then you can use those to, to make a trend. Um, so a lot of the values that you'll see on charts are the mean count um, across all the sites in a year for that species. Um, just to give you a sense, this isn't talking about entire population and we're not estimating entire population ever, but we're looking at changes in these counts of individual surveyors. And to start diving right into results here, um, when we looked at migration trends for the different species, um, so on the left here, we have long distance migrants, short distance migrants, and local breeding species. And the pale gray bars are Salish Sea trends, and the black here are um, outer coastal trends. And the striking difference is that for all migration strategies, birds in the Salish Sea are showing declining trends. And for all migration strategies on the outer coast, birds tend to be increasing, trends tend to be increasing. Um, so this was a really startling immediate result to get. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any significant effect of migration strategy um, for either coast. So it doesn't matter if you're a long distance migrant or a local, it depends more on where you're spending the winter. Um, birds on the Salish Sea declining more than birds in the outer coast. And when we looked at the diet trend results for these different groups, we found saw a similar thing, but a little bit more of a complicated story. Um, so for example, uh, piscivores, show the same trend as in migration strategy where Salish Sea is declining, um, outer coastal birds are increasing. Um, herbivores are the only group where um, there showed stable trend across all herbivores in the Salish Sea. Um, all other Salish Sea groups were declining. And then there's two stable and two increasing um, foraging groups for the outer coast. Um, one of the uh, striking things is that piscivores um, here seem to show one of the stronger, um, different, strongest differences between the Salish Sea and outer coastal populations, um, possibly indicating that there's difference in forage fish um, on these two areas. All right, so in the Salish Sea overall, we're able to analyze 50 different bird species. Um, of those 50, 12 were declining, um, only two were increasing, and 36 populations were generally stable. 
On the outer coast, we're, we weren't able to analyze quite as many species, so a total of 37 species on the outer coast. Um, th only three of these declining, two increasing, and 32 stable. Um, so in general, much, much better picture on the outer coast, um, even with our um, slightly smaller data set, um, than this, this kind of shocking 12 declining species in the Salish Sea. Um, so I'm going to uh, go into a couple of these trends and talk about some specific species over the next few slides. And um, these are the kind of figures I'll be showing that show um, across the 20 years generally what the shape of the trend was, um, and a number up here that indicates whether it's positive or negative. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about that as well. Um, so many species trends have shown stabilization um, since the last analysis. So as I was mentioning in 2012, um, we did, uh, before my time in this role, um, there's an analysis of the same data and many of the trends that were declining then and species that were declining then have stabilized since. Um, so that's some really, really good news. Um, so 10 of the 20 previously declining species have now stabilized. And these include um, harlequin duck, uh, surf birds, glaucous wing gulls, um, Bonaparte's gulls, red-throated loons, a few others. Um, and so just to, just to bring up some of the interesting stable trends here. So for example, horned grebe, um, was listed in Kosiwik in 2009. Um, in this figure, kind of seems to show stabilization in 2011, um, but really nice to see a uh, listed species federally that's doing well in the Salish Sea. Um, Great blue herons have been um, showing an improving trend since 2011 um, after a negative trend in the, the previous analysis. Um, and as all of you, I'm sure, know, um, here in BC, the great blue herons are a different subspecies, the Fanini subspecies, um, which is federally listed um, and generally thought to be declining. But so it's nice to see some, some good news from, from this survey at least. Um, Glaucus wing gull, as I mentioned, um, very common gull um, and showing stable trends. So good to see. Red-throated loon and surf bird, um, as I mentioned also, both showed strong declines in previous analysis um, but now we're showing more stable trends over 20 years. On the outer coast, most of the species were stable. Um, just, just to highlight a few here, um, marbled murrelet, um, which is another listed species um, and um, badly in need of protection, even though it shows stable trends because of uh, issues with breeding habitat in older growth forest, um, but shows this what looks like a decline, but we had pretty muddy data and pretty minimal data for marble millets early on in the survey years. Um, so as we've gotten better and better data, it shows a stable trend in the species. Um, Western grebe, um, another actually federally listed species, but showing as stable on the outer coast and horned grebe also in that category as well. Um, so the outer coast showing some really cool news that some of these species that are listed federally um, and are at risk federal, federally are doing well on our outer coasts. The negative trends in the Salish Sea um, are really where kind of the focus and the future of, of this project hopefully will go. Um, this is where clearly some help is needed because there's a lot of species declining, 12 out of 50. Um, these are the 12 species that are declining. I haven't put names there. To, um, Hopefully everyone can ID most of them, but um, so greater and lesser scop we combined for the analysis um, showing declines. Uh, the biggest thing to notice is that a number of these species are benthivores. Um, six of the 12 are benthivores. Um, so all three scoter species are declining. Long-tailed ducks um, and then two benthivore shorebirds. So Dunlin and uh, black turnstone, um, both at winter and in large numbers on our coasts, um, both declining. Also of note is that common loons um, and uh, grebes uh, eat benthivores in the Salish Sea as part of their diet. So they're not purely piscivores. Um, and so interesting to note that they are also declining. Um, uh, Dunlin um, feed on beaches and black turnstone on rocky intertidal habitat, um, but it doesn't seem to be um, necessarily one specific habitat that these benthivores are feeding on. Um, across these benthivore habitats, there are declines. 
uh, just to focus in on a couple of these. Um, so all three scoter species are experiencing strong declines. Um, this is the, the graph for black scoters here. Um, but this is consistent with, as I mentioned, a general decline in benthivores in the Salish Sea. Um, top um, fish eating species like Western grebe and common loon um, also experience declines in the Salish Sea um, and, and pretty steady declines across the 20 year period. Dunlin are a really important one to have noticed that they're declining. Um, about 20% of the Pacific Dunlin population so that's the population that moves up and down the western co west coast every year. Um, about 20% of that population winters in British Columbia, um, and a large proportion of that wintering population is on, in the Fraser Estuary um, and in Boundary Bay specifically. Um, so a really important thing to note for conservation of um, mudflats and important shorebird habitat on our um, lower mainland coasts. And then trumpeter swans, an interesting one um, that we noted declines in the Salish Sea of. Um, the Coastal Waterbird Survey is not the best survey to pick up trumpeter swans because while they do spend time in the intertidal and offshore, they also spend a lot of time feeding in agricultural land where we're not surveying with this survey. Um, we also, looking at literature, there's different research suggesting that in Washington, trumpeter swans are actually doing well. Um, so it's an interesting one for us to bring, bring to partners and look at how we can better survey trumpeter swans to, to see if this is a strong decline. Uh, but it's worth noting that agricultural changes in the lower mainland are decreasing habitat for some of these um, farmland using species. And so trumpeter swan might be a sign of that. On the outer coast, there are just three undeclining species. So these are the three declining species, um, Barrow's golden eye, which um, is, I think, going to be assessed soon um, for a, a federal status of threat or probably of special concern. Um, so interesting to note that we are seeing declines already on the outer coast of this species. And I think there have been declines noted in their breeding populations in British Columbia as well. Um, hooded merganser, a species that we don't pick up super well because they're relatively no low numbers that winter on the outer coast. Uh, but interesting to note that um, they are declining as well. And then finally, great blue heron. Um, so this is a species that, while there's large numbers of them in the Salish Sea, there's smaller populations on the outer coast. Um, and so it's very low numbers that we're picking up this decline with. Um, so um, possibly loss of estuary habitat on the outer coast and possibly some um, fuzziness in the data as well. A couple of good news trends on the outer coast. Um, redneck grebe are doing quite well um, and showing strong, strong increases. Um, globally significant numbers um, of redneck grebe winter on British Columbia's coasts. And so that indicates that greater than 1% of the world's population of the species um, spend the winter on our coast. And so this is really cool to see that, that they're doing well on this coast. Um, and then common myrrh also um, showing uh, increases, um, not very strong increases, but still increases nonetheless. Um, and this is really interesting in light of some of the recent mass mortality events that have happened. Um, so common myrrh, one of those large colony breeding species that are really influenced by when forage fish populations shift, um, largely due to ocean temperatures. And so in the past uh, five to 10 years, there's been a number of um, events where forage fish populations have moved to different areas and huge numbers of common mers have washed up dead as a result of not being able to find food. So good to see that they're doing well despite that. Um, and then two more uh, positive trends, um, these in the Salish Sea. Uh, ringneck duck is doing well. Um, there's been a continental increase in ringneck ducks um, since the 1960s. Um, when a lot of work started going, going into wetland um, restoration. Um, so that's uh, fitting with that model. And then Canada goose, I bet none of us are surprised to see is doing well, um, a species that's very adaptable and doing well across its range. Um, so just to, to talk about a couple of possible mechanisms for um, change and uh, trends in these species, um, and the first big thing to note is that 
a, a negative trend that we're picking up in our survey is not necessarily a negative trend for that species as a whole, um, but that uh, redistribution of where those birds are wintering um, it can play a, a huge role in this. Um, so a couple examples of that um, on the right here was a paper done a few years ago on Western and Clark's Grebe looking at wintering data based on Christmas bird counts and found that um, over a 30 year period, uh, Western and Clark's Grebe's moved south in terms of their wintering range um, quite significantly. And what this meant is that say those numbers went way down, um, which is something we're seeing in our data. And so this is one of those things where um, maybe the populations aren't changing, but we're gonna see fewer and fewer on our coasts. Um, also things like uh, response to predators can, can influence how many birds we're seeing. Um, bald eagle numbers since the uh, middle of last century have gone up exponentially um, as we've done better job protecting um, raptors, but this can also influence where um, some of our, our water birds are able to spend time and are able to feed as they're um, hunted and flushed offshore by things like bald eagles. And so that can influence some of the um, trends we see. There could also be influences from um, factors elsewhere. Um, so changes in the Salish Sea don't necessarily mean that um, changes are happening in the Salish Sea that are negatively impacting these birds. Um, they could be happening in the boreal or in the Arctic. Um, and then food availability in wintering areas is likely one of the bigger causes. Um, and this is one of the things that, that we want to point out to managers and um, other people that are able to act on this data as we present it further, is that um, if the outer coast is doing well and the Salish Sea isn't doing well, um, that's a very strong indication that um, food availability for these species is not as good in the Salish Sea. Um, and so trying to understand what that means. And that seems to be the um, biggest problem for benthivores. Um, so this, this group includes all the scoters, as I mentioned, um, turnstones, Dunlin. And previously, um, fish eating species have been shown to be the highest risk of declines um, or distribution shifts, like I showed for Western Grebe. Um, and our study confirms that fish eaters are still declining, but adds benthivores to that list of um, declining species. And so this new, new finding highlights the need to investigate impacts more of human-induced environmental pressures um, on the quality of the benthic environment in the Salish Sea. And so really understanding what's impacting the benthic environment, things like um, dredging, um, fishing and dragnet kind of practices, uh, runoff that, that settles to the ocean floor and can, can cover or impact this benthic environment and also vessel activity. So a number of factors that could easily impact and, and detrimentally impact the benthic environment. Um, and then for the Dunlin, we can start to understand whether there's um, some redistribution mentioned um, at play like is happening in Western Grebe. Um, so there's some new, new work going on in our coastal waterbird survey um, is part of a Pacific flyway wide um, shorebird survey. And, and so there's some work going on to see if shorebird um, wintering populations are redistributing. Uh, the biggest consistent major contrast in, this, in our results are the differences between the outer Pacific Ocean and the inner Salish Sea coasts. Um, and so long distance migrants, higher trophic level feeders um, are doing well on the outer coast, but are doing poorly in the Salish Sea. And so um, the, the big take home is our human induced environmental pressures, the main drivers. Um, and and a, it, it's very likely that that's the case. And a lot of um, things point to um, increased disturbance, um, increased fishing pressures, increased pollutants. Um, and some, some recent work has also pointed to um, declines in this in these species in the Puget Sound as well um, from some of our partners in Washington. Um, also just to point out that the Fraser estuary, this is a really interesting paper um, that um, I hope you can go out and learn more about another great in infographic about it here. Um, a lot of species in the Fraser are at risk of extinction due to habitat loss. Um, and so this kind of ties in with, with this larger Salish Sea picture that um, there's a lot of habitat that needs protecting um, 
in this region. And so some, some next steps that we're working on now and, and presentations like this are definitely part of that, um, are communicating these, these citizen science results to the public um, and also to management agencies. So talking to provincial and federal governments um, and talking to some of these agencies that can help um, implement some change in this region um, for, the, for the benefit of birds and marine life um, in the Salish Sea. Um, and so we're also gonna try to work with um, some research partners and academic partners to better investigate some of the mechanisms of decline. Um, so we're able to look at uh, what's declining and these, these broad scale trends, um, but to get to more of some species specific research on mechanisms is really important. Um, it's also a, a great opportunity for um, Canada to try to step up and um, to, to really make the Salish Sea um, a, a place to protect um, and to, to lead in nature-based recovery. And so protecting nature for, for people and for, for nature itself. Um, and finally, I, I have to end with a pitch to, um, to all of you and, and to anyone you might know in the birding community that um, this kind of volunteer data, while it might feel like your part is small if you're just doing monthly surveys um, of a small section of coast, um, the more data we have on this kind of thing, the, the easier it is to point to mechanisms and to point to species that are declining. Um, so more volunteers is, is always great um, for better data. Um, and I'll leave my email up on the next slide here um, and feel, feel free to uh, reach out to me. So I'm happy to take any questions. It looks like we have lots of time for questions. I must have talked fast. Hi, Graham. It's it's Colin. Um, I'm just wondering, one of the factors that's greatly affecting, I guess, not only the birds and the seals, but the the uh, the, sh the shoreline species that are affected by the outflow from the um, Iona wastewater treatment plant, because there's a few of us working on that. I think you know that James Casey is on that, that small ad hoc committee to try and get them to um, improve their purity there. And then there's also the issue of habitat being taken away by the proposed uh, terminal, Roberts Bank Terminal 2. So I'm wondering if, if is Birds Canada actively involved in in those two things, or are you kind of just staying back and watching what happens uh, with other groups' input? Yeah, um, so the, the Iona thing that you mentioned, uh, James is involved, as you know, um, yeah. and and I think we have some good evidence and at least anecdotal evidence from other regions that um, changing sewer outflow, outflow is really important in protecting that benthic environment. Um, and and I've heard similar stories from, from Victoria of um, huge changes to the benthic environment from divers and things as they saw sewage coming in um, and being dumped. Uh, Roberts Bank is a huge issue. Um, Birds Canada is working on that. Um, James, again, is leading a, a campaign to um, both be involved scientifically in providing this kind of data to show that this is a really important area for birds and for um, conserving these mudflats that are important for a huge number of shorebirds and waterfowl. Um, and so he's involved in that campaign and we're using as much of our data as we can to, to put forward this message that these are really important areas to protect. Mm 